Well, Krista, thanks so much for uh, uh, being willing to join me again for a conversation on various estate planning matters. Of course, uh, in this conversation, we're going to talk about uh, responsibilities or duties of a power of attorney. And um, it's a really relevant, I think, topic area. Hardly a month goes by where I don't have clients who you know, I find out that they're a power of attorney or there's a family member that asks them to play that role for them. And I think the majority of people almost in, involuntarily say yes, because they're goodwilled people and they want to help. But I don't think everyone really fully understands the implications of saying yes as a power of attorney. So I thought this would be a helpful discussion for people that are approached um, to me, think about what the roles and responsibilities are. And secondly, if you haven't been approached, at least having this information gives you sort of a, a, a set perspective on what kinds of questions you should be asking. So you can really determine whether being a power of attorney is a responsibility that you want to take on. So maybe I'll just let you start um, on this journey around power of attorney and, and maybe share at a high level your thoughts on this particular topic. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, stepping in as an attorney can be quite the role. And depending on who you're acting for and the complexity of their affairs, uh, it could be more or less work. So I do think family members and people are often saying yes to tentatively acting in that role without really knowing potentially what they're getting into. Um, and I think something that's really lacking is when people actually step in, they're not really getting any advice about what this role entails, what their obligations are. There's you know, a lot of liability when you're stepping in to manage the affairs of someone. Um, and depending on the situation, that, that liability can be even more um, intense in some situations. So it's a great idea for any attorney that is stepping in to first of all, get some legal advice, immediately get their hands on the document that they're acting under and take a careful review of that document because it will be your guiding um, guiding directions about what you're authorized to do um, and something that you're looking back to as you're taking steps as an attorney. So can I, I'll just interject there because, yeah. um, you know, when you say liability, I mean, taking on liability, to me, that's one of the reasons this discussion is so important. I don't think people realize that when they take on the responsibility, there's potential liability issues um, that could come back to haunt them if they really don't understand what the role or responsibility is. So maybe at some point as we go through this discussion today, you could unpack that reality a little bit, because I'm sure as a lawyer, you see that all the time where things go sideways and all of a sudden people are in situations where they never thought they'd ever be when they said yes to this role. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's many different examples of it. So kind of I, I can touch on those as we go through things, but um, I mean, really what you're doing is you're stepping in and you're having to make decisions and manage assets and finances in the best interests of the person you're acting for. So if you're stepping in to handle mom's affairs, you've got to step in and look after those assets uh, you know, in her best interest. So if mom was lending money to your siblings or to you, that's got to stop unless you're authorized to do that under the document. Um, if, you know, maybe someone was living rent free in a property owned by mom, that arrangement can't continue unless it's been authorized in your power of attorney. Um, maybe someone owes mom money. You should really be taking steps to collect those funds or making arrangements to make sure that uh, it'll still be enforceable to get those funds paid back to mom. So there's all kinds of different things. You, you have an obligation uh, to prudently manage those affairs and uh, just really act in those best interests and whatever that means for that individual person. Yeah, and I mean, so stepping in at the outset, uh, an attorney is going to have to take control of things. So um, the power of attorney document itself, if you've been appointed as attorney in that document, that will be your authority to take control of assets. Um, you're not moving anything into your own name. Assets and finances stay in the name of the incapacitated person, but you now have with this document uh, the ability to access them. Um, you know, if you had to step in and sell a property, you could do that as an attorney if it was in the best interests of that family member. Maybe if they can't live at that property anymore, that's something that needs to be done. Um, if you're having to restructure financial affairs. So another thing as an attorney is um, looking at 
the investments that person has, are they in a high risk, uh, a high risk form of investment? You should really be moving it to a more conservative form of investment because you're responsible for now uh, retaining capital, but also still earning some income there. So um, your investment responsibility is different than what you can do if you're just a regular uh, a person with capacity managing your own affairs, you can decide to take a little more risk. Yeah. Uh, if you're taking over as an attorney, you're a little bit more restricted in what you can do on that side of things. Are there are there any, uh, and maybe you'll cover this off. So when you talk about power of attorney and these responsibilities, it sounds like a lot of these responsibilities obviously will be financial related, paying bills, bank accounts, acting on the behalf of someone financially. Does the power of attorney journey into health issues or is that completely separate from what a power of attorney does? Yeah. So, I mean, here in Manitoba, we have um, two separate documents when we're talking about health uh, decision-making versus financial property decision-making. So we have health care directives that address medical or personal care decisions kind of more in that realm. And so the, the, what these documents are called varies from province to province. If you're on, in Ontario, I think they have the term power of attorney for financial affairs and then a power of attorney for medical affairs. So they use the term power of attorney, but you actually, I believe, still have to have two separate documents, one to appoint people for those two different roles. Mm -hmm. And you're maybe still appointing the same individuals, but you are looking to those different documents depending on the type of instructions you're giving. So it is two separate documents. And if you're you know, showing up at a hospital or at a personal care home to give instructions about what's happening with your family member, they should be really looking to a healthcare directive in that setting. But at the same time, there is some crossover. So if you're making a decision that has financial implications, that may be a healthcare decision maker decision, but they have to confer with that attorney to make sure that the financial consequences are something um, that can be sustained with the assets that that, that person has. Okay. Okay. What, yeah. um, what about, um, I guess one of the responsibilities, like you said, is with the bank accounts and writing checks or paying expenses, is there an obligation for a power of attorney to do detailed tracking or expense monitoring or budgeting on behalf of the power of, you know, of the person they're acting for? Yeah, that's a big item for sure. So record keeping, definitely. Um, as an attorney, you should really be putting together like an opening balance. So when you first took over control of affairs, what were the assets that you took control over? What were the balances in the accounts, uh, values of other assets? And from that date forward, tracking all the payments that you made and all the funds that came in, all the assets that were sold or uh gained. So all of that should be tracked by you. And I know that can be a difficult thing for attorneys, especially where they start off in a helper role. So you might be, you might have an immediate power of attorney where a parent has a child assisting them with their affairs. They still have capacity, um, but then, you know, they're starting to degrade in their capacity and ultimately somewhere along that line, they lost capacity, but no one really has a hard date of a formal assessment or something. So really the obligation for that record keeping began at the time that you were acting, fully managing the affairs because that person lost capacity. So best thing to do is track from the beginning all the way through um, that earlier portion before your family members lost capacity you're generally taking directions from them and you're reporting back to that individual because they're still kind of the final decision maker for their own affairs. You're just being delegated to. But once you hit that point that that it's called the donor, that family member who's giving you this authority, once that donor has lost capacity, you now have much more uh, obligation to them and you have to keep these records. And at that point, you're, you have an obligation to report to someone else. So it's no longer you going back to that donor. It's you going to either the nearest family member of that individual um, or going to the person that's been named in that power of attorney to receive that report, that accounting, we call it. Okay. So, there, so that can be in the power of attorney. So, um, but if it's not, if it's not, the person you report to is not listed in the power of attorney, mm. then it's, so did you say it's the closest family member? Or what's the determination around who you report to? Yeah, so this is something that could vary from province to province, depending on what 
the power of attorney act in that jurisdiction says. Um, here in Manitoba, we have a legislated order. So first that report would go to a spouse or common law partner. Uh, next it would go to children. Uh, after that, grandchildren, great grandchildren, then parents or siblings, nieces and nephews as the next alternate. And if you don't have anyone that fits any of those categories, uh, then your accountant needs to be made to the public guardian and trustee. Okay. There's a there's a lawyer in your office. I remember he did a presentation to our clients and he said, wouldn't it be nice that at the point at which someone needed to have the power of attorney, I guess, activated where the person's actually acting on their behalf, that was like a butterball turkey. And as soon as the turkey was ready, it would pop Ding. out a little, and then you knew, okay, now's the time. Yeah. Of course, of course, it doesn't work like that. So what is the what is the practical, it's always nebulous where you're getting this transition point where the person has, is, is capable of making their decisions, but they're beginning to de delegate a little bit. And then there's this transition point. Is there a legal document? Is there a sign off? Or is it just a matter of fact that the person's reached that point? Like, what does that look like typically for many people? Yeah, case by case basis. So, I mean, there's a, something called a springing power of attorney. And, and when you have a springing power of attorney, that one's actually brought into effect on the incapacity of that donor. So on that one, it's usually more straightforward because um, you've got an assessment done, the document couldn't come into effect until that assessment was done. Okay. So on those types, uh, usually no. But so, that, so that's where you've got, would you have like a, a physician or a psychologist or a, a medical person making that assessment? Yeah, physician actually signs off on the document Okay. after assessing you, determining that you don't have the capacity to understand the consequences and decision making related to your own financial affairs. Okay. Yeah. So there'd be a little section in that document that uh, you sign off to bring the authority into effect. So if you're looking at your power of attorney, wondering if it's springing or if it's immediate, there, there's probably some uh, section that's going to say, this doesn't come into effect until I have been assessed. And it might have a space for a doctor's signature, or it might say you need to attach um, that kind of an assessment or a letter from a physician or something like that. And that would be a springing power of attorney okay. and an immediate, which is one that you could start acting right away. So if you were a, a family uh, member that was starting to be that helper, then you're dealing with an immediate power of attorney because you've already been authorized to begin acting, even though the person has capacity, you're stepping in now and that immediate power of attorney will continue to authorize you to act through that incapacity and onwards. So that's kind of the, the difference is there. So I can, I can see in many situations where the person that has asked you to be power of attorney, particularly from a health standpoint, where someone may still be cognitively very capable, they can make their decisions, but just from a, um, a physical capacity issue, may not be able to get to their bank or get to appointments where they sort of just delegate to the power of attorney to kind of look after some of that stuff on their behalf. Would that be pretty common? Is that often the gateway to beginning to act as a power yeah. of attorney? Commonly, we definitely see that. So that yeah. stepping in kind of maybe there's a mobility issue or or even just some portion of the affairs are being taken over. The, the person, you know, is still overseeing kind of their stuff, but they just want the child to take care of paying the day-to-day -day bills. It's not something they want to handle at that point. So often family members do find themselves starting off in this helper role. And there's generally a little, you know, less liability in acting that role because your family members overseeing things. So when you start off there, you don't really realize your obligations have changed when there's this gradual transition to being the full, uh, full decision maker and having full control over the assets and being entirely uh, in control of the person's financial circumstances and situation and care um, going forward. So. And that transition is hard. So case case by case basis about when it's happened, um, you might have a medical assessment or you might have that family member at a care home. And, you know, there's been a determination or conversations about um, that person being no longer able to manage their affairs on their own. Mm -hmm. um, or it might be something that isn't, you know, that uh, distinct of a moment. And I think really what people try to do is kind of determine even looking back sometimes, okay, it was probably in hindsight this year, this month, roughly, or that summer when this happened, we saw, you know, these uh, medical issues arise or mom had a fall and wasn't really able to manage things after that point and, and kind of using that as a date to work from, but it is sometimes it's hard to figure it out. And when you're the attorney trying to figure out when these obligations have changed, 
it, it is difficult for you, for you. So yeah. It, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of gray there, right? Definitely. Um, so if, if kind of cash flow monitoring or budgeting or keeping traffic expense is, is obviously a very key role, mm-hmm. are there, do you recommend any resources to powers of attorney? Like if you're sitting with someone in your office going over the responsibilities, do you direct them to specific resources to help them with that role? Or um, is you just kind of say, this is what you need to be doing, and then they can go talk to people they know or their advisor financially to figure out how to do that. What, what's the general process for that? Because it sounds like it's a really big, big part of the role. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the the format of what they need to keep is that opening balance and then building on that with an inventory of what's coming in and out. Um, they are probably having that annual report they need to do. So a closing balance for that year and having that reviewed with the family member, whoever that recipient is. I'm uh, sorry, of, no, just yeah. to interject. The annual report, is that a standardized format in most jurisdictions or is that just something that the power of attorney sort of comes up with? Is it There's a direction by provinces on how that report's handled? Yeah, not really. So there's no okay. format under our powers of attorney act of what that uh, accounting should look like. It's really just, it's this review of whatever that person's assets are, uh, that person's finances are reviewing what was done in that year. Cause you could have someone who's got real estate properties and income properties, and maybe all that's coming in and there's special considerations there that need to be reviewed. So I guess, cause it's so different on a case by case basis. Yeah. We don't really have any direction on that. And again, that's why it's so hard for attorneys to figure out what they need to be doing because it's, it depends on the assets, the power of attorney itself that they're dealing with um, and the person's circumstances. So basically they're doing the cash flow, the income and expense monitoring. And then it sounds like they're also having to do a bit of a balance sheet or a net worth. What are their assets? Are there any liabilities? Yeah. And there needs to be in the file some sort of documentation or a narrative about, okay, so we had to do some renovations on the house for mobility reasons and it cost $20,000. So we took money out of the portfolio to look after that expense. So that anyone looking over their shoulder two years later and they see the portfolio goes from, their open portfolio goes from let's say $200,000 or whatever the number is to 70,000, the family members going, where'd that money go? That's obviously a really important, you got to justify how that capital was used. Is that, would that be a fair comment? Absolutely. So as that attorney, it's really protecting you to give those reports because you're having that check-in with another family member or person. And if they're, you know, kind of signing off on the work you've done, they're saying, yeah, good job. Everything looks good to us. That will protect you in the future. If someone comes back and has questions um, or if that person you're, acting for the donor passes away. Now you're handing the affairs over to the executor and the executor is obligated to you know, review what you've done because they're taking over everything now to distribute okay. beneficiaries. So okay. that might be another person that has questions. And if you've had your work kind of reviewed in that report, it, it helps um, um, back it up that, you know, you've done a good job. You've had, had confirmation of the decisions you were making in the expenditures uh, that you were spending through, through that period of time. So that's another good reason to do it as well. So, so your recommendation, and it probably doesn't always happen where if I'm power of attorney, I have to do an expense allocation for something has to be done. Are you saying ideally you should be talking to the closest family member and saying, listen, we've got this expense coming up. Here's what we've done. We've gotten some estimates. Here's what we think we should do. We just want to get you to sign off or just give some basic agreement that you're okay with this allocation. Is that how it happens? Or do you find that that's maybe where power of attorneys get in trouble sometimes? They go ahead and do things that they think it's it just needs to be done. And then a family member maybe questions that allocation after the fact. Do you know what I mean? Like I can see yeah. where that could be. I mean, I think in practice, I'm not seeing as much the attorneys going to uh, the recipients of the accounting in advance for, you know, every expense that they're, they're having. But I mean, if there was a really big one, if there's something that they yeah. think beneficiaries in the future would take an issue with, yeah, yeah, it's a great idea to go have that approval for sure. And there are certain things, I think part of it too, is educating yourself on what can you do or can't you do as an attorney. So there are certain things that you might think without, you know, getting advice maybe on, on what you're doing. You might think that um, continuing to make gifts to the grandchildren every year because 
grandma always made gifts uh, at Christmas and birthdays of $500 or $1,000 or something. And you're just continuing on what grandma said she were her wishes. Um, and that may have been what she would have liked, but if there was no authorization, like specific authorization included in that power of attorney document, then that attorney is not authorized to make those payments. And if they do make the payments, um, that could be pulled out of their own pockets eventually if someone comes back and takes an issue with that. And if that um, that person now, like during their lifetime, needs those funds for their own care because maybe their um, situation means they need, need more support and services coming in, they might need those funds. So um, there's different things that, yeah, maybe you would think you can continue to do. So also having that check-in for that purpose or getting advice to make sure that that's still something you're authorized to do is definitely important. Yeah. So the, and I guess the, the, the cash flow net worth naturally extends to tax issues, making sure tax filing is being done, getting the T-slips, either doing it yourself or hiring an accountant to do the filing. So that's part of that whole financial reporting piece. Yeah. So if you're fully taking over those affairs, you're obligated to file those tax returns and file them on time. So if there's penalties or something, those could be payable by you if you filed late. So all of that is under part of the work you need to be doing annually. So we talked about this a little bit during our last video, and that was compensation uh, for representatives, powers of attorney or executors. Power of attorney area is a little more nebulous. If, if there's nothing in the power of attorney agreement that allows the power of attorney to um, charge accounting fees, consulting mm -hmm. advice, you imagine if somebody had some corporations, some holding companies, mm -hmm. you know, they need accounting help. Can they just go ahead and charge that against the person's uh, accounts um, for that consulting expertise? That's legitimate. Are there any caveats around seeking legal and accounting advice on behalf of that person and paying those bills? Yeah. So anything that's to the benefit, it goes back to that. Is this in the best interest of the person you're acting for? So getting that accounting advice or legal advice, definitely. I, like that's a, an important thing to do. It's a worthwhile thing to do. It's probably going to put you in a better position to look after their affairs, um, either like making sure you're doing it legally and, and doing the accounting appropriately, keeping as much money in the uh, estate or in their, their property as possible. So definitely those bills for that work would be paid from their own funds. And that's legitimate. And that's standard for any attorney that's managing those things. Um, to the extent that you are maybe incurring costs personally. So for some reason you have to pay for something because a, uh, a bill comes up or an expense comes up and you can't get it paid from uh, that person's funds for whatever reason, you're also entitled to be reimbursed for those expenses. Be very, I'd make sure you're keeping receipts and things again. So that yeah. when you're doing that report, it's very clear what that money was for. You're not just paying, pulling out $500 cash and we've got no receipts about where it went. So um, tracking those things. So reimbursements are always okay. Uh, but in terms of compensation, then that's a bit different. So compensation to yourself as an attorney, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're someone who's preparing that power of attorney for yourself and you're you know, considering whether you want that attorney that might be acting for you to have compensation, um, if you want them to take it, then it's best to include the, a clause, even just a general clause that says, I would authorize compensation. Um, some people will have an annual figure or try to, you know, give an hourly rate or something. Um, best to include that clause because that's really going to open the door for them to take it and maybe to be able to have that compensation approved by the recipient that's reviewing those accounts each year. Uh, without a direction like that, that attorney is really going to need to go through court approval process for that compensation because they're basically a trustee and to get authorization to take any money that's how they'll have to do it which is going to be uh, more complicated and possibly incur some more cost uh, to get that that uh, approval so if, if somebody's an executor um, executor fees that are charged is actually considered taxable income actually earned income um, one of the strategies uh, for estates is to make a bequest or gift from the estate to the person acting in that capacity. My understanding that's tax-free, that, that, that form of compensation, even though it's notionally to pay for what they're doing as an executor, that's legitimate? Is that an okay thing or is that an unspoken kind of, um, no, you can't formally? It's something. It's a conversation I do have commonly um, with people that are doing their wills. So 
one of the things with structuring it that way. So if you've got compensation that set out, this is for the purpose of paying this person because they took on the role of executor and they did all this work, I'm paying them X amount of dollars or a percentage or something like that. So as soon as you say something that makes it clear it's connected to their role of acting as executor, it's taxable income and they have to pay tax yeah, on so it. CRA gets, uh, they follow the bouncing ball. Okay, right. Yeah. So you have to be very vague. Here's, here's a big quest. Yeah, so if you do a gift, so you can yeah. totally, you can do that gift to that person instead, say, yeah, they're getting $5,000. This is a complete gift to them. They take it. But the issue with that is if I'm appointed now as the executor, there's a gift in this will of $5,000. I'm not required to continue to act as executor. There's a gift there to me. Um, I could choose to not act, just take my gift and I never have to step in at all. Or I could still decide to act. I could take my $5,000 and then still apply for compensation because executors are always entitled to compensation. And there's nothing in this document that says I'm getting compensation. So you could double dip in that way too. So I talk that through kind of with clients and uh, I mean, you well, know, that- hopefully the people they're naming, they're not going to take those steps or double dip or take yeah. money and not act, but yeah. No, those, but those are important things. I mean, I often say to my clients, I mean, the, the value of, of seeking out advice from a lawyer is that they, they tend to see way too many of the worst case scenarios. So they're going to counsel you through what the potential risks are and the yeah. client will make, make their final decision. But obviously when you say those things, that stuff happens mm-hmm. and, uh, and clients need to be educated on that. Okay. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Now on the side of powers of attorney, um, have you seen situations where there's just kind of notional gifting where the person just gives them money sort of, you know, um, non in a non-structured way to say, here, here's some dollars to help you with some of your costs or, or is it more just you, you need to get a front of that and have that built into the, um, the power of attorney agreement? Yeah. I've never, I've never really structured, you know, a, a gifting provision in lieu of compensation, like trying to think about it that way. I mean, I guess the idea there is if that power of attorney, that attorney that's acting is taking gifts and just them and no one else is getting gifts. I don't know. I like, is there even a question that? And then why, if there's other kids in the picture and one child's acting as attorney, well, why is just that, that person getting gifts? That's not really fair. And then are we doing equal gifts to everyone, but that's not really you know, um, compensating then at all for the extra work that the one child's doing. So it's kind of a sticky thing that I guess I wouldn't recommend because of those complications and what it might look like. Yeah, yeah no, that's fair. It's, it's yeah, that, I, that makes sense. <laughs> now, what about, so we've got, you know, obviously understanding the bank accounts, preparing a balance sheet, keeping track of income and expenses, having a narrative in the file as to why certain monies were spent for what purposes, you're documenting that, reporting to um, the closest family member, keeping them up to date on what's going on. And then if the person dies, then you also have this, I guess, obligation to do a handoff to the executor and bring them up to speed on what's going on uh, with the file. What are some other, so that's basic, that's like bookkeeping and basic finance and that kind of thing. And then the tax filing, what are some other responsibilities, you know, kind of like the big three or four that you see come up for powers of attorney. Are there any others? Other big responsibilities? Yeah, I mean, I could almost even go with like other big mistakes that sometimes we see. So um, we talked about gifting, but early inheritances too. Like sometimes you'll have a property that an attorney is now managing and the plan under the will might be that cottage, let's say cottage is going to the family we can just transfer that cottage now or, or take mom's name off as a joint owner now or something. And those are things that you can't, can't do. So you can't, you're always looking back to what's in the best interest of this person. And we have to protect assets for them during their life and make sure that they're set up as best as possible during their lifetime. So early transfers of assets or early inheritance inheritances um, are a no go there as well. So that would be a situation where let's say that there's a family cottage, mom is uh, 90, it's in the will or 85 and in the will, there's a bequest or a gifting to the kids, let's say, Mm -hmm. and they go, you know what, this is going to happen anyway. Let's just re-register the cottage, get it done now. So you're saying that's, that's a no, no. I mean, you're, you're now you're, you're, 
you're kind of in, in dangerous territory. Exactly. And it, depending on how that property is held, you probably couldn't even get it past land titles as an attorney trying to transfer that. Okay. Um, so okay. yeah, it's depending, but yes. But I can see that, you know, people attempting that even with, um, It'd be interesting. I don't have experience with this, but with, you know, financial assets, there's a portfolio and there's money flowing to um, future beneficiaries for expenses. They've pressured the power of attorney to release money from the portfolio. They look at the will, they're going to be a half beneficiary anyway. I don't know what checks and balances there would be for financial firms around the power of attorney coming in doing a redemption or a transfer to an account to somebody else. Do you know offhand? Like, do you see, and would that be an example of the kinds of things that got powers of attorney in trouble where they've, they've made really unauthorized transfers to beneficiaries or family members instead right. of protecting those assets for the person they have the power of attorney for. Yeah. Big, big liability issue for sure. So you might think like, it seems like it's in tune with the rest of the plan or what you understand that family member to have wanted, but if you make that kind of a transfer and later we realize, oh, this shouldn't have been done this way. Like we've got to reverse this. So you got to, you try to go back after those assets to the person you transferred them to. If you can't get them back from that individual and like, what if that individual's died and now those, you know, shares have passed on to other family members or something, you might not be able to claw it back. You as attorney are going to be personally liable for that value that you've, you know, pulled from the estate that you really have remained in the estate for those beneficiaries. Okay. Yeah, no, so good. That's a good mm -hmm. uh, comment. So um, I know you might have some other danger areas or mistakes that they make, but here's a question for you. Do you have any recommendations for family members or families doing a power of attorney agreement, appointing someone and helping them to deal with potential, because uh, I imagine it's there, potential pressure from beneficiaries or other family members to do the things that you're just talking about? where that poor power of attorney now is having to deal with this onslaught on an ongoing basis by certain family members to release assets early, or, you know, this is what mom would have wanted. Cause I imagine that there are a lot of power of attorneys out there. They take on the role. They're not even thinking about this stuff. And all of a sudden there's an, uh, an assault on them. You know, there's pressure to begin doing things that their common sense and their spider senses would say no, but they may do it anyway. Do, do you see that kind of thing go on? Yeah, I mean, the thing is with any power of attorney, unless you've authorized it directly in the document, it's just those kinds of transfers just aren't something that an attorney can do. And that's going to be across the board, like powers of attorney law across the country. So, I mean, it's nice because the attorney can fall back on that. Any Right, so they, they can say, listen, I'm sorry, but here's what I can do. Rule. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. you can, beneficiary, you can go talk to any lawyer you want to and ask about whether this early transfer is something that can happen. And any lawyer is going to say no, like, these assets have to be retained and maintained for this person while they're alive. It's, it's not something that's going to be allowed unless there's a special authorization in the power of attorney. So, and then, but I mean, when you have that kind of an authorization that could even open this can of worms though. Um, that's why you need to be really specific, specific about what kind of gifting or early transfer you might be allowing under a power of attorney, because if you're just saying, yeah, you can make unlimited gifts to family members well, maybe now you do have a child pressuring you to transfer shares because they are making a claim that that's what mom wanted under that authorization. So it could almost open the door to things like that. So any other problem areas you want to make sure that we unpack for this discussion today? Yeah. So, I mean, another thing for attorneys to keep in mind is what their period of time is that they're authorized to act. So we've talked about kind of how their uh initial acting comes in. So when the person loses capacity, if they're acting in that helper role and continuing on through that incapacity, when that donor passes away, that authority to act under the power of attorney has ended. So there's no additional, they, no additional steps that they can take once the person's passed away, their authority to access accounts and things has ended after that person passes. And now the executor mm -hmm. needs to be taking over. So even if that executor and attorney is the same person, there's now uh, a new process. You've got to get that 
will and begin acting as executor and provide that will to those financial institutions um, and maybe have to go through a probate process to get control over assets. So it's inappropriate to continue to rely on that power of attorney. You now have to transition to the will, which is something that I don't think attorneys always have their minds turned to when the donor eventually passes away. Okay. It's like a toggle switch. Yes, exactly. Okay. Switch is right over. Okay. And I think another thing to keep in mind too is the estate plan that the donor has in place. So attorneys, when they step in, don't always get a copy of the power of the will. Sorry, they should be getting a copy of the power of attorney. Um, And it's almost a good idea to familiarize yourself with what the content of that will is, just so that when you step in and start to manage these assets, you're not uh, accidentally, um, you know, causing gifts under the will to be unable to be fulfilled later. So if there's maybe, and we try to, you know, structure gifts and wills so that these things um, aren't triggered. But if you are someone who's designated a specific account to go to a beneficiary on death, so, you know, account number ABCD at this financial institution is given to my granddaughter. I've seen those accounts be consolidated and then, or, you know, used as the primary fund to pay for expenses and now they're depleted and there's nothing left to give to that grandchild. So just keeping those things in mind, um, I, I try to provide directions when I'm drafting powers attorney about these different things. If there's funds that we want to use as a last resort uh, for funding the person's care, or if a cottage should be maintained and expenses and taxes paid, even if that person can't go there anymore because they're incapacitated, they want to make sure that that property remains there. So it's fulfilling the estate plan, which might have a cottage trust or something in the will. So having knowledge about what that ultimate plan is, is great for that attorney so they can make sure they're not doing anything um, that invalidates it, I guess. That's really good advice. So I, I, I suspect that there's usually not great communication between what the will says and what the intentions are and the day-to-day activities of the power of attorney and how that might get in the way of some of those intentions. I, I, I suspect there's a bit of a, um, not deliberate, but a, a, a firewall between what one person's doing and what that document's you know, triggering and, and the other. Like it's- Definitely. And I think a lot of people, they, they do those wills and they lock them away in their safety deposit box. And there's maybe not a reason to share that with all the kids at the time that you're yeah. you know, doing that document. Um, but if no one knows and has taken a look, then, you know, you might have some surprises on your hands later down the road. There's one little example that's kind of like that in my world where um, people will draft their wills and they'll have, uh, let's say, testamentary trusts as part of their will. And it, and it assumes that when they die, there'll be money going to the estate and the will will then distribute assets to the trust that's set up as a result of the will planning they've done. And then later on, they're at their financial institution and some hotshot advisor goes, you know, you should have all your accounts with beneficiary designations. So it goes directly to beneficiaries. And all of a sudden you've now short, all that great work you did with your estate planner for very intentional, good reasons. 10 years previous, it gets forgotten about. And the person says, we could, probate fees are not relevant in Manitoba anymore is my understanding, but there was a time when people would always want to reduce probate costs, have direct beneficiary designations. Later on, they forget why they had done it the way they had done previously and the the estate plan blows up, right? So that communication is really, really important. Definitely. Yeah. And that's every time I'm doing things on the estate planning side and we're incorporating trust or there's if you have young kids and you want to make sure all the money is going to be held for them to a certain age, yeah. um, we always want to make sure the funds are paying to the estate, not the individual, because then they'll just be cash into their hands and we're bypassing the nice structures or trusts that we've implemented in that will document. So absolutely a huge, huge piece um, that people need to be reminded of and that sometimes they forget and they yeah. change those beneficiary designations down the road. So there's only so much you can do if you're not talking to your client every year to remind them, don't make that change, you know? So I try to educate uh, as we go through the, the estate plan and our final review and, and tweak that. So at least they, they think about it or, or think, oh, I should just, you know, make, give a quick call to make sure this works with the overall estate plan. Cause I'm always happy to check yeah. and give that. Yeah, out. no, for sure. And I, I don't think many people now, I think it's great that you do that. Like you encourage your clients to periodically just connect review and make sure they're Mm -hmm. tracking, because I do think that people it's like one and done. 
they do their will or their legal documentation and it, it collects dust someplace in a, an old box or a safety deposit box and it gets yeah. forgotten. Absolutely. And, uh, so that's, that's good that you, you try to encourage your clients to kind of just review and have a conversation over the years about what's been put in place. That's a changing picture. I mean, what it looks like today is different from three, oh, five, sure. 10 years down the road. And you want to just give those documents a review, just even yourself to say, okay, are these funds going to the right place? Did someone pass away? Is someone, yeah. um, you know, is someone on government support now? And maybe we need to see if they can even receive an inheritance or if there's something we need to do there. Um, are my executors still people that would be good for this role? Do they still live in Canada? Cause there's mm-hmm. issues if you're yeah. non-resident um, and same thing with attorneys under a power of attorney, like are these still people you trust to manage your funds? And if some, some things happen with those individuals you've named as attorneys, big reason to make a change and make it right away. Um, yeah. Cause you only want to have people that, that you trust implicitly to step into that role where they're able to gain access and control of all of your funds and affairs. And they're looking after you. So. Yeah. Good point. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of closing comments uh, for attorneys. So we talked about compensation earlier and how you might be able to take compensation as an attorney. But another reminder for people is if you do take that compensation, you are actually held to a higher standard for the work that you're doing as attorney. Okay. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. And as well, when you are stepping in as an attorney, once you begin to act, you are obligated to continue to act. So you can't just step down and allow an alternate to take over. If you decide it's too much for you, you would have to be court removed. Um, or, I mean, the next alternate could step in, but only if you've lost capacity or you've passed away is the only other ways. So you really need to be prepared to take on that role if you're stepping in in the first place. And good idea to, at the outset, get some legal advice, know what you're getting into, know what your obligations are. Uh, if you're going to step in and take on that role for that individual. And um, one other point, and this is, this actually happened to someone, I have a client who drafted a will and had asked the person who's the executor to be a power of attorney at some point, but that conversation was forgotten about. Years later, um, the uh, person needed to have power of attorney look after their care um, and she didn't realize that she had been actually appointed as a power of attorney for this client. It was its discussion, but she didn't realize it happened. Yeah. Next thing you know, this person has no family. Um, she's losing capacity. And now the person I know finds out their power of attorney. So in that situation, that's probably a difficult situation that the agreement's been drafted. She's been listed. And for her to go time out here, I wasn't expecting to do this. Yeah. Um, it's not as easy as saying, you know what, this is inconvenient. Like I, I, I don't want to have a party to this. There's a formal court process you have to go through to be taken off that. So if she never started acting in the first place, she could, as long as she did at the very outset, she didn't begin to act. There's no obligation at the very beginning, at the outset. She, there's no obligation for her to act. She could disclaim that role. There's a moment in time with a decision. Yes. After. Okay. Right at the beginning. Okay. And if she never steps in, then she wouldn't have to go through that court removal process, which does make sense because if I'm signing myself a power of attorney, naming people that I'm not telling, it's not fair that they absolutely have to go through a court process now to get removed. But once you have begun to take steps and act in that role, that's when that obligation continues. Okay. Um, but it would be a difficult situation for that individual. Like presumably she had some relationship with oh, that yeah. individual. And yeah. if there's no one else that's there to act and there's no one else named in the document, like who's the alternate, the public guardian trustee is taking over. That yeah. might not have been, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't think this person was crazy about the idea, but they stepped up they did the right thing. And, and so it, it had a happy ending in the end, but yeah, it was a bit of a surprise. So I would suspect like one of the things that I, I, I think you do, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but I think one of the things you do for your clients is if they're named power of attorney, and I think it applies to executorship responsibilities, you actually spend some time with them outlining the responsibilities, right? That's one of the things that you Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and Honestly, I don't have to do enough of that work because people aren't going to get this advice. So I try to tell uh, clients when they're doing powers of attorney, okay, these attorneys should 
go get some advice. It doesn't have to be with me, but get some advice from a lawyer about what their obligations are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, absolutely happy to do that. I do that on occasion uh, when attorneys are stepping in, just even just an hour or two, right? Just get a couple hours to talk through that document. What are you authorized to do? What kind of accounting records do you need to be keeping? Um, how are you taking control, making sure this person is looked after? Is there any big liability issues you should be thinking about? So definitely worthwhile to you know get that advice. It's a bill that can be paid from that person's funds because it's part of what is entailed in looking after their affairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's something that whether you're in that attorney role or you're stepping in as an executor or you're stepping in as a trustee for a trust, all of those roles, like great idea to go get legal advice, figure out what your obligations are and what your role is going to be in that in that position. Oh, perfect. This has been really helpful. So uh, for those of you that um, are interested in getting some advice from Krista, there'll be contact information in the show notes for this video so you can reach out to Krista. So you're now you're licensed where you're in Manitoba, you're in Ontario as well, or where about I myself, work? I'm practicing just in Manitoba right now, but our firm is also doing work in Alberta and Ontario. So we're spread perfect. across those three provinces. Okay, provinces. perfect. And also there'll be a link. So Chris and I are having an ongoing series of conversations on various estate planning topics. So there'll be a link to the last video that we did as well. So again, Krista, thanks so much for uh, participating in this discussion today. No problem. Anytime. Okay. Take care. <laughs>